welcome to A Scrap Life, a podcast solely focused on the hustlers, grinders, operators, and business owners who live and breathe the scrap metal industry every day. We are the original recyclers, no suits required, just guts and hard work. Here is your host, Brett Eckhart. The power of social media is crazy, especially LinkedIn. I saw a post that Eddie Ornston posted about the different grades of scrap brass and copper pricing. I took that post, I forwarded it on to our guy here at United Metals, Nick Snyder. And next thing you know, Eddie was flying into Boise, Idaho to talk scrap, teach us more about the different grades of brass, and sit down for a podcast. Eddie has truly lived a scrap life, and I had a great time shooting the shit with this guy. Take a listen. Well, I'm sitting here, Eddie Ornston from Alliance Steel. And man, I'm just super stoked. This is a just a straight pleasure for me, and this is the power of LinkedIn. The re, that's the, the reality of it. Um, don't ever get it twisted. You know, with with the way we do things, um, we're very we're very um, outwardly um, vocal about how we run our business, who we sell material to, and how we go about things. But one of the advantages of that is that we get to meet people that you we may not have ever met by just posting stuff online and looking what other people are doing in the scrap industry. And I met you via, I saw something you posted on LinkedIn. Yes. I sent it to Nick Snyder on our sales team. And I said, this is some good information. Check it out. He reached out to you. You guys started the dialogue. Next thing you know, I'm you're in Idaho. Boise. And man, I can't thank you enough for uh, making the trip out here. So it's a pleasure. Thank I mean, you very one much. One of the things, like I say, in the, the scramble is the number of people I've met, truthfully, really from around the world. Yeah. And the and have the same conversation, and we're all talking about the same thing. So last night we had dinner, and we were talking about, I mean, we were telling stories and just kind of, like, really just kind of getting to know each other. And I felt pretty good. I felt that I had a, some longevity in, in the industry going back three generations. And then I talked to you, and, and that's what I... No matter how much stuff you think you know or how many people you know or how much longevity you have, there's always somebody that has more, it's done more. And when I talk to you, I'm super humbled because <laughs> of how much you know about scrap and how long you've been in the business and just the true history of it. So I'm third generation. You just told fourth. me you're fourth and you have sons. My son is a fifth. Fifth generation. So... If there's anybody out there living the scrap life or that has lived like a truly full scrap life, I mean, I don't think it gets any more deep than no, it's where about you all you from. know. Yeah, and uh, around family and everything else, the scrap business is really based around family. Yeah, I mean, I consider pretty much a lot of the people I talk to and everything else, they're family. I may not be close, but they're like my social network, and they're like my friends because if I've been so devoted. To scrap, it's like, you know, just love meeting the people. Yeah. And you just, that, that, it becomes your network, right? It becomes my network, which, just to digress, like my wife. I've moved from a few, been to a few different cities along the way. Yeah. And uh, she's just kind of come along and it's like, oh, well, wait, I don't have any friends. Well, <laughs> I still got my friends. Yeah. <laughs> and that's my social network. Uh-huh. So give me a little when you give me a little history lesson um, similar to to yesterday last night when we were talking about just kind of where how deeply rooted your family is in this industry kind of where you're talking about your mom your my dad mom, my just kind of give the give our audience a little bit of just kind of history lesson on you know where the orange stems when the orange stem actually uh, extended from uh, the Davis family which was originally uh, West End Iron and Metal, founded in about 1912. Okay. And uh, prior to that, uh, the other generation, which I didn't know right away, was the Zulk family, which had uh, Duluth Iron and Metal, or ASCON Corporation, which was also in Duluth. And the history of uh, West End is my grandfather traded wild rice, furs, hides. So I got involved in deer hides, beef skins, uh, mink, fox. Uh, actually, one time the bank had to uh, have my uncle go out of the fur business because my other uncle gambled in wolf one year. 
<laughs> and it wasn't so good. So we were back down to the deer hides and the beef hides. Why has why has traditionally hides been so connected to scrap? You know, your not opinion? only hides, but also the rag rags business. And uh, there's another th- on sacks, wool. If you go out, at least in the upper Midwest, you have seed, wool, hides, and it was just something else that you had to take that came along with the other stuff so you could take care of everybody together. Okay. And the same time, you know, you started up a usable steel yard or stuff so people could bring in their scrap and you could supply them usable steel at a lesser price and you can keep their money. Okay. Was Makes pretty sense. good with that. Yeah. And uh, I both worked, uh, my father had a smaller operation up in uh, northern Wisconsin, which my brother still has, and still conducting business. And that business had been around since, I believe, the 1930s. Your older brother or younger my brother? middle brother. Okay. My younger brother. Younger brother, okay. Uh, the way it was, uh, I had a, even a younger brother, but he was too heavy for the light work and too light for the heavy work. Okay. Or however, vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> so he would just kind of s- sit in the office. Uh-huh. Uh, but growing up at my dad's place, it was like you finish school, eight, nine years old. Well, where do you hang out? I hang out with mommy and daddy in the yard. Yeah. And I sit in the back and start cleaning brass. Didn't like using the alligator shear or anything. Uh-huh. And uh, just watching people come in and just... You know, whether I'd sweep a floor or anything else. Uh, One interesting story is uh, my dad had to work for somebody else for a while. And I'd work weekends there. And I learned the story of how to push a push broom. The owner of the company, uh, Louis Phillips, uh, he got mad at me. I was Part of my job was cleaning up the garage and the trucks. Uh And he found me pulling on the push broom. He spent... (laughs) This is a guy, millionaire, uh-huh. spends like almost an hour with me showing me how I'm supposed to push the broom. The bra- broom. Uh-huh. And, and a he, millionaire back then was... I have no idea. Yeah, that's a, word, that's a, that's a lot of money. You know, that's a lot of money. Today's money. Yeah. But the, but the concept of it is somebody that ha- had done well for themselves still understood the details the, enough the detail. that the details are what probably made him a millionaire. Oh, and, you know? and he was the crane operator. Yeah. So one of the biggest fears is backing into him because he'd, ru- he'd basically run with a loudspeaker or uh-huh. the horn on his crane. Okay. And you just worry about this guy, but he could pick up a dime with his crane. Oh, yeah. And if later I became a buyer, and he was one of my good suppliers. And uh, very interesting, there were very few people he came off the crane for to meet in one of my first visits. He said, oh, he's getting off the crane and coming in to see me. Uh-huh. So, which was kind of an honor because, yeah. n- and then later even he'd say, hey, bring him out to the crane. So I'd have to negotiate buying scrap <laughs> That's while he's in his crane. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to the old school guys. Uh huh. And so you you told me last night that your your, your dad had a yard. Yep. And your mom's, mom's family, family had, had a, yard. a yard. So it was kind of a split deal. Uh, so, it mean, was kind of like... Uh, well, maybe they didn't want to quite bring him into the business, then they found him another yard yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere else. Exactly. Which I have talked to, if, you know, we've had a few of these podcasts, and we were talking about how does, how does family, how did families grow the scrap business, you know, years and years ago? Well, you just went and got another family member, and you brought him in, and then you said, okay, now you're going to go run this yard, or you're yeah. going to run the Ferris, or you're going to run the non-Ferris, or you're going to run the scale, and you just brought in as many family members as you could. You could. And then, because those are the people you could trust, because it's a cash business, and you you know you got commodities and money's coming in, money's going out. So you wanted to bring as many family members in, and maybe the job scenarios weren't you know as plentiful as they are today. So it was a real when you said family. It was business, very difficult uh, back then. If if you had a if your father or your uncle or somebody had a scrapyard, you couldn't get a job at another scrapyard. They were always worried about your coming, taking whatever you learn yeah. and bring it back to your own family. Yeah, that makes what? Oh, you don't want to learn. And I think, and that the, the like, yards were very protective back then. Flash forward all the way to 2020, where 
people like myself are posting on the internet where we sold the material to. You know, I don't get into pricing because that's not, that's a different deal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that people would just, I've had the conversation with multiple people that have been doing this for 30, 40 years. And they're like, when you started posting on there who you were selling shit to, that just kind of threw everybody for a loop. But I think people are trying to come around that the, I think the, the, I it's saw transparent. the veil is getting lifted on the industry. We do a lot of good things as an industry. But the original recyclers. The original recyclers, when people say that, you know, the original environmentalists, however you want to, you know, state it. But I like to kind of state it as a primary process, processor of secondary raw materials. Yeah, I like that. And now I'm going to get a business, business. card. I just, it's gonna, the title's going to be that long. So your mom and dad have two separate yards. Yep. You worked at both of them. I worked at up. both of them. Okay. And uh, my mother wanted somebody in, from her side of the family in the family business, which was a larger operation, which gave me the experience to get some foundry experience, be able to handle ferrous, non-ferrous, stainless, aluminum. So pretty much uh, run from A to Z. Okay. And we were doing, uh, th back in the 1930s, the family was actually shipping uh, scrap iron to Japan. Wow. So like they one of the original exporters. Dock. Yep, and continued with a non-ferrous with Philip Brothers, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, with making brass packages. And we had a 100-year-old foundry in the town, and our family had been supplying the foundry for 100 years. You were explaining this to me last night, and this was, I mean, new to me, about why your area was so crucial. Um, you said it last night, but basically... There's this the, one of the foundries was in town, and basically, and all the UP cars are one of the or the BN cars. Oh, the B, a BN. They all had to end Burlington up. Burlington Railroad. All the scraps from the United States wound up in Brainerd, Minnesota. And the reason so behind that was because that's where they, their switchyard was. No, that's where their switchyard, or that's where they figured they'd have one accumulation from wherever they, from wherever it is. Okay. The steel, uh, the brasses, so, and also growing up in the. Northern Minnesota with the mining industry, the taconite, the iron ore stuff, you got a taste of different types of scrap, just like scrap varies from every part of the country. Yeah. And just through my brief conversation with you yesterday and today, I mean, I, I don't think there's many people out there that understand the percentages and the makeups and the of, of material like no, you that's do. No, that's, you know, uh, that's what I had to do. I just... I kept studying the chemistry and knowing I wanted to know if I'm going to supply somebody some material, I'm not going to ruin what they're melting. Yeah. Or it also gave me the opportunity to say, hey, if I can give this to you for less money, instead of you having to buy pure ingot or other stuff and use scrap instead, that was a savings for them and it was an upgrade for myself. Yeah. So after you you worked at your your, your uh, father's scrapyard and then your mother's scrapyard, then you decided it was time to go work to some larger. I just yeah, I just you know something. I just wanted to know more. Yeah, you know instead of you know calling no disrespect, but on the smaller yards and stuff, I just wanted to see what else was out there. And I had the opportunity to go to Omnisource Corporation. Okay. And they gave me a huge opportunity to cover pretty much Canada and things west of the Mississippi. And uh, that was fine. And then I've been able to work with people over in China. So when you were, went to work for Omnisource, that wasn't the same Omnisource that people know today. It was, I mean, it was it a was big company. It was before Steel Dynamics. It was still it, a large company. It was a large company, but it wasn't nearly as large as it is today no i think okay. it's definitely much larger today and but it was very personal back then too i think some of the corporations are a little too corporate for sure well once once you become publicly traded and some of those other things i think that kind of puts the it takes the the personality Person, out of that it, was right? actually the exact word i was it's not as, and this business one of my favorite people not favorite people but the type of people was I was always dealing with the old, the older people. Yeah. You know, the guys in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and a lot of them could relate to me because they either knew my grandfather or my uncle. So when I'd be going in, I already had an introduction. Because when we talk about U.S. Steel had a steel mill up until, uh, I think, 1972, 1973, 
up in uh, Duluth, and we were one of the major suppliers, and we'd actually buy boatloads of scrap to come up from Chicago. Oh, wow. Up into Duluth, huh. the mill. So at, when you were at Omni at that point, you're, you, were, you were buying ferrous, non-ferrous? I mostly, or, f- mostly concentrated on the, on the non-ferrous. Okay. I had a great ferrous department, but I was dealing in that. And uh, the only other thing I introduced him when I first started is anything I could do to make money was fine. Yeah. So I actually even brokered a few loads of deer hides. Okay. <laughs> then you Which when I got back more back. business with other people, uh-huh. oh, I don't have to do the hide business anymore. I got enough customers to work on. But the reality the of it is, is you had the mentality of wherever you worked, you wanted to bring value, right? And if I it's, did. If it's bringing, if it's brokering deer hides to make a little bit extra money to help get you while you built the book of business on the non fair side, that's what you did. And that was the scariest thing. Uh, leaving the family business and going to somewhere like Omnisource is, whoa, which customers are going to still come with me? Can I develop some of these customers or not? And one of my little stories with Louis Phillips, who I was working with, who gets off the crane with me, I had kind of a budget at Omni, and I was kind of getting stretched where I was kind of getting to the limit where, hey, maybe I, I'll be out of business in December from the uh-huh. Berkshire. All of a sudden, I walk into his office. We sit down. Sells me about three million pounds of scrap. Fair, non ferrous. Non ferrous. Nice. About a uh, million and a half pounds of just some copper. And I and then figured what I'm making from this. Oh, I could still be in keep my office up here in Minneapolis where I was at the time uh-huh. for another six months based on go. what I was making. Yeah. And uh, the only <laughs> real problem with that particular thing is. The first load goes down in Dolan Brass, and what discovers? Oh, there's copper-coated steel in the bricks. So after making this huge deal, mm-hmm. I took a plane ticket, went down with the magnet, pointed out all the problems, went back to Louie, and uh, said, hey, this is the situation. Well, there was another rejection. So finally, we have to kind of eradicate part of the deal. Yeah. And in this particular case, if anyone remembers, we were operating in a backwardation. If you know what a backwardation is, Go ahead. that's where the uh, spot market is trading higher than the futures market. And at some point, there was as much as three, four, five, ten cents in the backwardation. So if you didn't deliver the scrap the month it was done, mm-hmm. they'd penalize you and you'd go to the next and is that the reason for the backwardization is Strong is demand. because people think that the current market is is better than what they anticipate the future market to Correct. be because they feel like maybe we've peaked out and the demand is so take. strong in the beginning that they just got to take the stuff and they're paying the premiums because they have they have sales yeah that and that was a difficult time with. to operate and what year is that do, oh Roughly, I, I want to. I want to say it was pretty much from the the, the late eighty late eighties. Okay. I want to say somewhere between eighty six and ninety. I may be incorrect in there, but you'd have to go back to a customer and say, "Well, you know, well because of this, you now owe me the back on top of it." Yeah. But the point is, if you're in a backwardation, generally the person, if the material was rejected or something, you'd still be able to reclaim that amount. Gotcha. Back. So, in other words, he's going to be able to sell it for more money than what he originally sold it to. You. So your relationship with this guy, um, say his name again. I'm sorry. Uh, Louis Phillips. Yeah, your your relationship with Louis enabled you to go to him to and him say, from hey, a family with long time. Here's the deal. Like, I'm and, not and trying to me screw crap. you. I mean, I talked to people that said he's never come in to see me, or some people that have sat in his office uh-huh. for six hours and the guy still wouldn't get off the yeah. crane. Meantime, he's beating me up for a quarter of a cent a pound for material and he puts me on hold and he's basically buying 10,000 shares of Presto Industries or something else. Yeah. And he's sitting there beating me up. And uh, so it was, a, it was a probably as much of a game. It was a game to him. Yeah, a little for bit. him. Or, and I think, and I think he was kind of proud is. of me because I, he basically taught me a lot of stuff along the way. So he was like, he was, he was still one of the... my mentors, yeah. And so being your mentor, he, he was still... Maybe this. He's still teaching you how to they negotiate. Right. So, like, exactly. you can look at it from he's beating you up or he's still teaching me how to negotiate quarters of uh, a yep. cent 
on a sale. And I'd be, or, yeah, the, 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 my dad, <laughs> when he brings me over there, I was I'm maybe 15 or 16, and I was basically cleaning electric meters. The little silver, and I get, as a kid, getting paid, you know, 10 cents a pound for whatever comes out. Yeah. It was kind of nice. The only thing my dad said is, hey, try to ignore the language you're going to hear here. <laughs> because it was about the first time I got to hear on some of those words that all the guys oh, yeah. oh, were yeah. doing. Uh -huh. and to, as a kid experience, all the garbage coming out of the mouth oh, yeah. was a great experience. Well, if I, I've said this before, but if you want to... If you want to deal with all walks of society, in the scrap industry, we get them all, right? You get the guy that's a multi, multi millionaire who looks like he has zero dollars to his name. You get the multi, multi millionaire who looks like he's a billionaire. You get the roughest, the drug addicted, the uh, just the average Joe that wants to clean out his beer cans. You get from A to Z. And I, I pretty much got along it. with all of them. Uh huh. You just, which is relationship. Just it's a it's a super relationship. Oh, the one when you mentioned you don't know there was uh, a gentleman we were doing with. He basically right off the farm with the overhauls, probably about uh, maybe five three uh, three hundred pounds. A uh -huh. heart attack waiting to happen. He was in those days. I shouldn't say those days, but uh, a lot of people walked around yards and they always carried a lot of cash. Yeah. So you go in and basically just buy the scrap and they get a reasonable all of a sudden uh, he's in one day and we get a call he gets a heart attack we uh -huh. get a call from the hospital hey can somebody come here he was carrying 15 grand okay in his pocket that we had to hold for him okay and said what who carries this kind of money around uh -huh. well when he goes in he's able to buy it at a cheaper price yeah uh basically my job my father's job with louis phillips was uh going out to the auto wrecking yards and basically offering so much money and they do it every spring or they arrange the different yards and they go in and basically buy out the yards, any of their insulated copper, the motor blocks. And of course I'd go with my dad, he'd be doing this on, we'd be going out to these auto wrecking yards on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh huh. And that was his whole function. They pay so much and then the equipment comes in, flatten the cars and it wasn't done like you were paying so much per ton or this well, that. I've had I've heard my dad t t tell the story a lot when he was growing up. Is they actually had to rip all the seats and all the garbage and shit out of the cars to yeah. make it clean material to send it to the steel mill or whatever before they were, had all the, these they mini actually shredders used to, and mega watch, shredders. Used to have uh, they'd burn the cars. Okay. Actually burn them. Okay. And then they would basically rip the frame off, and then they put them into a iron baler. And then make bundles. So they make a like a sheet bundle, like a number two like a number bundle. Two, and then they cut the frame up. Frame off HMS. Is HMS. Okay. And then they just kind of basically separate basically. the whole car. And now, that's kind of the shredder function. Correct. And it does that in the downstream and on the back end. Hey, in those days, I'd sit at the alligator shear and cut uh, plate scrap into two foot by two foot pieces. Oh yeah. Uh, one of the <laughs> hardest jobs is in northern Minnesota is working the shaker table outside in twenty below weather. Ugh. You'd have a little barrel there with uh, <laughs> with wood to try to keep yourself warm and pick off the stuff that's coming off of the Harris. I'll give them a little plug on their shoe. Yeah. No, we had an old Harris shear. Yeah. old Harris. 702. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the number or not. Yeah, we had an old guillotine Harris shear. Um, and then we had a 500, I think, before we bought our Sierra 7, 700. Um, we had a, then we ran that. We bought that one used. And we ran that one for a long time. And those old shears are pretty freaking dangerous. I mean, they were compared to the shit we have nowadays. Hey, I who, mean, think, who, who really thought of safety down there? I mean, no. I, I, I can tell you I got it clipped in the chin a few different times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so by you riding around with your dad, going to auto salvages and, you know, just going out and you learn, you learn the material, you yep. learn how to talk to he people. You pay me a dollar an hour to ride with them in the truck. You learn how to buy... You learn how to just, you know, what what has value, what doesn't. I mean, that's got, that gives you a huge and leg I up. And I learned about battery acid at the same time. A battery spilt in the truck seat, and I thought I'd be so kind, and I wiped it up with my butt. <laughs> Until you Definitely did. wound up at the hospital for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it quite <laughs> burned that bad. <laughs> so did you know at, at an early age, did you know when you're in your, you know, 8, 10, 
I mean, did you always know what you were going to do? Or did you just No, pretty much. I, it was like, well, pretty much so. It was, I don't, I don't want to say it was the easy way out. It's just something I grew into. Uh-huh. And knowing that I had this business to fall back on, yeah. I, d- I did not apply myself as much as I possibly should have. But again, uh, all family functions, this is what was discussed. And my children growing up, basically we'd go to different outings. Uh, the Institute of Scrap would always have, you know, the, a lo- at least up in the upper Midwest, uh, the meetings included family. Okay. So everybody would come with their kids and everything else. And I don't know if they liked it or not, or my wife, because I'd be, my territory was North Dakota, South Dakota, the upper peninsula of Michigan, and stuff like that. And I just take my wife in tow it, yeah. and the kids, and we'd be making stops along the way. Even nice. if we were kind of going on vacation, yeah. I just like to see and visit yards. And there were very few yards that ever did, refused to meet with you. You could just knock on the door and say, oh, come on in. Mm-hmm. So when my wife says, can we just go on vacation somewhere and not <laughs> stop at a scrapyard? And I was like... I, I mean, we could, but I go, but what fun is that? You know, that, like for her, she yeah. doesn't like that. And but. for me, I mean, at, in your job capacity, you were buying scrap from these yards and, or at least, you know, Correct. creating contacts and creating relationships. And me, I don't, our company, we, we, our focus has never been to buy scrap from other scrap yards. I mean, we really just work on, um, small dealers and commercial stuff. And, um, and that's kind of more our wheelhouse. But that doesn't ever stop me from if I see a scrapyard or I drive by one or we're in we're at whatever city we are in, I'm like, where's the scrapyard? Like I want to at least go check it out and even if it's just a drive by, I'll go do a drive by and she'll just be like, really? <laughs> Every time. I'm well, you like, want yes. sometimes you used to do a drive by just to check what the other competitors had it in. One hundred percent. Yeah, I just want to see. <laughs> see I just want to see what's going on. You know, I mean, when we go to East Idaho, her and I, because her parents live. East from here, about four hours. We have, but if we go east from here, we we have just uh, we have four yards. So I'll stop. I'll be like, it's, she goes, this should be Brett a four hour drive, and you make this into like a seven hour drive. And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, we're on the way. And she's like, it's not really on the. I'm like, it kind of is for me. Yeah. But I want my kids to see it. I want them to, to get a taste of it, whether they decide they want to be involved in it or not. Like that's, I really want that to be up to them, but I want them to know how much I like it. I want them to know like how good the industry has been to me. And then if they decide they want to get involved, great. If not, go do whatever the hell you want to do. Yeah. Like my son, I mean, he, he ate it up. He, he learned everything. I, uh, uh, like I say, uh, his first job, uh, I was looking for a job for him. And uh, when I called up American Iron Metal out of Montreal, they said, well, what a twofer. We'll take you both. So that's yeah. where his first taste of uh, the scrapness was. And through American Iron and some other places along the way, I've managed to really travel the world and yeah. visit scrap yards, whether they were in Italy or even in Israel. Uh, I've uh-huh. been to a number of the yards in Israel and purchased scrap out of Israel or out of Europe to go to China. And uh, like I say, one time I actually bought uh, recycled battery sows from Israel and shipped, shipped them by container back to Montreal. Wow. So when you, to go back up a little, to go yeah. to back up a little bit, when you, you were at Omni, when you left Omni, where did you go after that? I, I went to a company called Sturgis Iron and Metal. Okay. And that was in... And um, Sturgis, well, South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, Indiana. And Sturgis, Michigan. So when people think of Sturgis, they think of, what, South Dakota or whatever, like where the big... You know, I never thought about it. You're yeah. right. They do. But the one you're talking about is actually in... Uh, just a small town in uh, northern, in, uh, over the border of Indiana into Michigan. And I was just, I just pulled it up here a little bit, cause, little bit ago because you and I were just talking about that. And this w- wasn't while you were there, right? But this is, they, that's this when they built... After. They built the biggest shredder um, in the United States. Which got to be able on the History Channel. Yeah, on the History Channel. So when you went to Sturgis, that was the, that was the name of it at that time? That was the name of the time. Okay. And you went to Sturgis, and what was your kind of, what did you do at Sturgis? 
Uh, Much of well, the same. Sturgis, I basically took over all the all the non Ferris sales and directed the salespeople with pricing. Okay. And still buying scrap, I had customers that followed me from 1978, and this is already getting into about 1990, 1991, that have followed me for 30 years. Wow. And again, it's like it's it it is strange because. You don't get to see them like now as much, uh, but it was all pretty much by phone. You did a lot of phone. I mean, you, yeah. you did not have the internet for communication. And here, just as I just digress to a story, uh, my first cell phone, I believe I bought in 1986. Was it the suitcase one? The, the, n- no. Uh, what had happened, I rented a suitcase one. Uh-huh. Uh, I was out of town and it was, oh, nice. Oh. For five dollars a day, you can have a phone in the car. Nice. Okay. I I haven't have been able to make a deal with that because I was selling some copper up into Wolverine Copper into Canada that I know was happening. It was going to be a big deal, so I really wanted the communication. Yeah. All of a sudden, I go back to I Amiens and I had to give my bill. The bill for the three days was six hundred dollars. <laughs> Didn't know that it was like two and a half to three dollars a, a minute. minute. Yeah, on top of the <laughs> on rent. top of it. Yeah. So uh, what I actually did, you had a choice back there of the Motorola flip phone or Mitsubishi had the Diamond Tell, which wasn't a flip. Okay. And uh, I, I made a deal with them. I said, I'll buy my phone. You just pay the bills. Yeah. Okay. You know what a cell phone cost back then, one of the small cell phones? Go ahead. Twelve hundred and fifty dollars, and I'm trying to figure out what sort of idiot says he'll buy his own cell phone really for company business. Yeah, and they just pay the bill. Uh huh. You know, after a long time, you start. Thinking, yeah. Why did I do that? Uh, but actually, my first experience with uh, uh, the cell phone was back to my family business up in uh, Duluth, where my uncle had one of the Motorola Land to Sea phones in the car. Oh, wow. So when I'd go visiting him stuff, I'd borrow the car and, you know, kind of roll down the window. Hey, I got a call for you. Yeah. And use that. So, I mean, but the $1,200 was an investment, obviously, but how much more business could you do once you had the cell phone? kept it. And once I had that one cell phone and some people who do know me and stuff, I started out two cell phones. Yeah. And it was was kind of funny because I'll use it Omni at that point. They actually were, uh, they actually started tracking calls in and out and I'd make my little call sheet that I was doing and uh, I'd go down to the research. Hey, how many calls kind of handled? Oh, about a hundred, 110. Uh-huh. And that wasn't even all from my cell phone. That was just stuff coming into the office. So I'd basically be working between a couple cell phones and the other phone. And yes, would I get things confused once in a while? Yes. Now yeah. at an older age here, I'm down to one phone. There you go. So I don't make the same mistakes and leaving the other phone on so people can hear the conversation. How long have you had this phone number you have right now? I've had this phone number for probably uh, 25 years. That's that's great. I've, I was telling somebody the other day, I've had the same phone number since the day I started, which is 16, since I started full-time after I graduated uh, college, I've 2004. So for 16 years, at least I've had the same phone number. Uh, my last year of college, so 17 years. And a lot of it is because our business is so relationship-driven. Once that phone number's in your phone and it's put, it's, it, everything's good to go, you never know who's going to call you from when or that they like, oh, I got an item. I might know a guy that can, exactly. that can move this for me, right? So that the phone number has significantly more value than the actual phone. Like the phone, I don't care. That number is it's crucial. Exactly. Very crucial. Yeah. Because then somebody can get a hold of me that I might not be thinking about, but they might know that I have the capacity to do X, Y, Z. I was thinking about my grandfather and the, you talking about the phone calls. And so my dad and my grandfather at, at different times would dispatch all of our trucks on the hauling side. So they could never be away from their phone. And t- they always had to be pretty. The phone, t- or did they have the radio? The no, Motorola, well, you, yeah, but, no, but they the can never be away from the because we have CBs, but in the trucks, but they can never be away from the actual landline because you have you know customers coming in that want you to move a load oh, yeah, of lumber exactly. or your or your guy your guy saying we need to move this load of scrap whatever that is, so you always had to be pretty tied to that landline. To, oh, it was kind tied of tied to the office. You yeah. Get up. 
One of the other benefits I had, like I say, since the family had been in there, I'm still doing, I'm doing business with this, some of the same consumers my grandfather dealt with. That's awesome. 80 years ago. So, which is amazing to me. Uh, and a lot of the mostly the foundry stuff. stuff, like mostly like local no, domestic. No, even some or? mills or brass okay. and makers, some of the aluminum smelters and things like that. Yeah, how but, has that foundry business changed over the last, let's say, since the '90s, '80s? Like, how, what have you noticed? Well, a lot of them don't seem to like to use scrap as much. Okay, because the, unless somebody can guarantee what chemistry, they, chemistry. Uh-huh. And that was the biggest thing was learning the chemistries and the different alloy numbers. I just I spent time in my yeah. early days just reading and making sure I would know what somebody could use and convince them that there's enough of a savings yeah. to use it. But, you know, again, it depends on a metallurgist. Uh, one story, briefly, is uh, Elko or some of these other consumers, they consume copper. Mm-hmm. So whether it was copper shot or copper chops in the beginning, and there was one particular plant I went to to visit, and I said, oh, no, we don't use any copper. How do you not use any copper? Well, our maintenance people and our metallurgist doesn't mind all the insulated wire and stuff they pull out, uh-huh. they would use for the copper units. Oh. Just Pretty burn- smart there. Yeah, yeah, s- saving money. Yeah. And I think in the beginning, a lot of places used what they called copper shot, but all copper shot was taking bare bright copper, pouring it over water, and making uniform BBs. Yeah. So why couldn't the places just use a uniform chop? Makes so sense. I think a lot of places have gone to chops have replaced what was used to be produced as shot. And some because somebody had asked me the other day, and I, I never really, you know, looked too far into it, but they were saying, why don't you make is you we we have a chopping line. They said, "Why don't you make like twenty five pound bags and sell it to as deox or or not deox, but sell it to copper uh, edition, yeah, copper yeah. edition to some of these mills?" And I'm like, ah, I just I'm sure people are already doing that. You know, I mean, n- not a lot. Uh, we actually when I was at uh, T Jan out there or Shine Brothers slash, we actually did have a bagging machine and made the twenty five pound bags. Okay. Are they still For doing the, it to this day? You know, that I don't I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'd be shipping it down to Louisiana. There was but, one particular plant that wanted the bags. It yeah. had to be 10 pounds or whatever that weight is. Interesting. To do it. You got paid the extra to do it. Okay. And, but again, it's uh, the way the metallurgists at the plant. I mean, some people are a little more creative, and some people just want what they want and will not look at any... And they're, they're willing else. to pay the extra because they don't want the guys throwing in the 25 pounds. Or no, they, they don't want to throw in the bag. Full. They don't want to have to shovel or keep track and have it already measured so you don't have to, uh, nobody has to guess. So there's significantly less foundries now uh, oh, yes, been than there was in the, in the 80s and the 90s, 80s and right? 90s. And the other thing with a lot of foundries was pay terms. Not not disparage or just like uh, the steel mills today. Yeah. I mean, who get who wants to wait 120, 160 days for the money? You must have experienced that more. Than oh yeah, you're I definitely. Have. And yeah, it's the only industry that if the market goes up, you have to fill an order. Yeah, the we were just talking about out. this last night. I'm like, man, <laughs> yeah. I want to be. What business can I get in that if the market goes up, you, you don't have, have to, to fill things. the order, and if yes. it goes down, I can tell you. Sorry, the price is down. I have no idea <laughs> however that came from, and I don't know if scrap dealers ever would run in a revolt or if we'll get in trouble for even having the conversation. conversation. It's, but it's still, it's one of those deals where you're like, hmm, it must be nice. The right? other thing is a kid kind of grew up was trying to, the confusion I had between gross ton and net ton. Yeah. You figured the mills already in these days buy by the metric ton. Yeah. <laughs> or or yeah, net the ton. short ton, the long ton, the metric ton, the gross Somebody ton. Somebody tells the me net. they're paying $160 <laughs> a ton. Uh, oh, and as naive when I was doing some of the iron, uh-huh. oh, that's a gross ton. Shoot, that wasn't as good as the price yeah. of the 145 net ton. Yeah, you might as well knock 12% off that deal, and then that's what you're really going to get. Get it, yeah. get it, get Yeah. So uh, from the foundry just, business, I mean, after you, you um, left Omni and you went to Sturgis, um, Sturgis, you've uh, you went to actually I slipped to up. Aim or no? Go ahead. No, before I, I basically wound up at a place up in uh, Flint, Michigan, Lorbeck okay. Metals, which was out of Montreal. Okay. Since my wife was from Montreal 
and that's one of the reasons I handled Canada. I, I was up there pretty much for all the Jewish holidays, and I just developed relationships with a lot of the Canadian dealers okay. uh, to sell to and buy through. And in those days, you had Naranda, you had Wolverine Copper, another company called Metals and Alloys, which have yeah, basically been bought out. Uh, Wabash Alloys is one of those companies that bought out Metals and Alloys. Okay. And it's funny, I'm still doing business with some of the same people. They're with different companies now. Yeah. Yeah, because I think once you're in, I was I was having this conversation the other day. Once you're in the business, some you know you, you might try and get out first, but you're once you're you in, you, it's hard. I'll, I'll give you the story. I think it's my, hard to get out. I think my son knew when he was about nine years old. Uh huh. He wanted to be in the scrap business. I can't find the letter, but he wrote uh, you know in grade school or something. They say who's your hero or whatever, and in part of the con- the letter context said yes, I want to grow up like my dad and get paid for talking on the telephone. <laughs> That's how he saw it. Just yeah. talking on the phone. <laughs> I, uh, I've i always known I was going to be in the scrap business my whole life. Right, I grew up going to the yard when I was a kid. I was All my friends were pretty jealous. I, I was one of the only kids that could take a BB gun to my dad's work, shoot all the windows out of the cars, and that was a great thing to do. I mean, hey, was, we'd shoot me and my brothers, out. we used to have demolition derbies at the yard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some of these cars would come in running. Oh, and we'd awesome. just be able to run them into a pile. Yeah. Or uh, I learned how to drive in the yard on a, with a two-ton, on a two-ton old school With truck. a stick shift. Stick shift. I mean, a shitty seat. I mean, just, but that was kind of how, that and a three-wheel forklift, a three-wheel heister with that nasty single Oh, with the single wheel, wheel in, the, in back. the back. That was all manual uh, shifts as West, well. At the West End one is up there. We had, were three floors. Okay. The bottom basement was for the hides. Okay. Okay, for the beef hides and the deer hides. You'd have to salt not, them. Yeah. I'd have to take my clothes off when I got home. <laughs> oh, yeah, because I bet that I stunk stuff. pretty good. Yeah. And then the top floor, so we'd be bringing that little heister or whatever up and down in the elevator. Like a so freight elevator, like a freight deal. elevator to uh-huh. put store stuff up above. Those heisters were gnarly. Like those things were, and they, they were never all let me skinny, ride equipment. The skinny tires, like I mean, those things were so tippy. I mean, but back in those days, the other, the only other option was a barrel cart. Oh yeah, I don't know if you're old enough to even uh-huh. remember that. I don't know what that. You basically be loading semi trucks with a a barrel cart. It had a little hook. You'd hook yourself on the 55 gallon drum. Hold yourself back and wheel it into the truck. Yeah. Get off and go get another barrel and do it without the forklift. <laughs> we loaded our first containers with that three wheel. I mean, just trying to jam shit in the containers with that three in it thing. It would just smoke and barrel smoke out of that container. And we we're just jamming <laughs> stuff in the in those containers with that little three wheel forklift. So after Montreal, Montreal after, to, after Montreal to aim. Uh, actually, after uh, Montreal, I uh, I teamed up with one of my oldest customers, uh, Residual Materials at the time, and they had a joint venture in uh, China. So for a number of years, I was basically buying stuff, again, uh, around the U.S. and other stuff, and we had our own facility to take it into. Okay. In, and that, and that was able to bring me back to uh, Minneapolis, okay, which was my hometown. And uh, my father was getting older, so at least in the later years there, I was able to be in Minneapolis for Spend them. more time, help them out. And, but then my children move, <laughs> moved into Ohio, so that's why I'm up in Ohio right now. So you're kind of following the, your children I'm and following still the children staying in around. the industry? Yeah. And now, I mean, you have one, one of your sons down in Texas, right? He's got yep. his own yard. Is that the same one that... When he was nine that years was the old, one yeah. who wanted to say he wanted to get paid for talking on the phone. I like it. So when you were at AIM, which is a pretty big out, big scrap outfit it's, itself, I mean, you similar similar so concept. It's been, yeah, it's I basically been able to maintain a, a book of customers and pick up new ones along the way. Yeah, uh, I've always been kind of friendly. Yeah, and pretty can, much an open can, book. Oh, yeah. pretty much an open book. Yeah. Within reason. People, yeah. within reason. Yeah. Hey, look, I can throw a sling a little bullshit once in a while. Yeah. That's a, that's a scrap uh, mentality. That's and, a scrap. And somebody who knows well. me, I'm on the phone with them. They know whether I'm 
yeah. giving the truth or not. And the problem is sometimes I've been told, Eddie, just keep your mouth shut. I, I share a little too much information. And backing up a little bit, one thing that actually probably changed the industry, and there was uh, one person out in Massachusetts, uh, I, I believe it was Glickman Scrap, but he said he's worked an older fellow. He said, I've worked my whole life knowing who to sell to, who to buy from. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this little thing called peony yeah. <laughs> comes up, and all the information's right there. Yeah. And all my customers know what the stuff is worth. So I, in the beginning, I think peony definitely was one of those things that kind of changed the industry. And I remember getting the peony on our fax machine and every day, and we would look at that, and then, then eventually it would come to our email. And peony, peony still exists today. Exists um, today. And I would assume there's still a fair amount of people that look at it, um, or else they wouldn't still be trying to hustle up business. But that's where the internet changed all the dynamics of our industry. The information that people get on the market now? Yeah. Whether a farmer or anything else, they know where the markets are. I mean, there's some specialties, but they know where the COMEX is, they know where this. But back when it first started, the only way you got your information was through the, we had a telex. Yeah. So you'd have to be sending telexes back and forth. You wouldn't get an answer on your sale for the next day. And in those days, uh, they had limits on copper trading, which was maximum five cents per day. So. When you're in a down crash, everyone's out of the market until you somewhere get it goes down to fifteen or twenty cents. Okay, so nobody wants to get catch the falling knife. Exactly. Yeah, but the information that just it was a little easier, especially when from buying purposes mm -hmm. because you didn't have such a informed. Which I think, both. and that's where it comes back down to there is no the internet. I've heard people say this, and I I believe it to be true is the internet takes out the middleman. It basically squeezes because it takes the information and now everybody's operating on a very similar, somebody's going to have, you know, there's people a that penny have a here or there if they have an old order. If they have an old order or if they have a really good home for something and they've built, but it still comes back down to the relationships, right? Yes, and with the peony, a lot of people felt the broker is going to get cut out. Uh -huh. Well, you know, and some people don't like to sell to the brokers. Some dealers say, I'm going to sell to the mill because if I have to discuss anything, it isn't. Myself, which was as a broker and as a seller, I like brokers. Yeah. They do the financing. If you want fast money, mm -hmm. you can get your money. And they take the risk in case the business is good. It yeah. goes under. So you know, I do. I've seen that. Yeah, I do. I have no problem. Brokers are fun to deal with. Well, and here's the and thing. And they serve a purpose. They do 100% serve a purpose. And I do a lot of business with brokers. I do a lot of business with mills. I, there's, I, it's just like anything. Like there's a reason that there's a, a square nose shovel. There's a reason why there's a pointed shovel. There's a reason why there's a big shovel. There's a reason why it doesn't mean that it's not a shovel. It just means that there's a Somebody different tool Somebody has a position and they've taken the whole mill out of a certain position. Yeah. So you may only have the broker. And again, today, these brokers uh, are really somewhat what the, I believe they consider merchants because they're doing toll conversions. Okay. They're putting in the scrap and taking out whether it's siding coils or MLC coil or whatever it is, so they, got, they can sell it to those end users. And they yeah. got a premium to do that. Sometimes there isn't the premium, they'll just sell the scrap. But it's kind of nice when you can put material into a place and take material out. Because yeah. you're not at the same risk. Yeah, and you, you can basically because yeah. it's your inventory. Exactly, you, you still get access to the inventory. And it, I remember somebody, you know, back when before Ste when steel crashed in '08, somebody was, you know, they were talking about uh, they had sold a you know a shipload of uh, HMS to a rebar mill in Turkey or something, and it was one of those. Well, we'll just instead of sending you money, we're just going to send you a boatload of rebar back, right? Yeah. At that point, what do you do? I mean, you're either you're going to take the scrap back, and th th at that point, the market was coming off $100, $200 a ton, you know, in a week, or do you just take that, sacrifice the shipping, come back, or do you take the boatload of rebar back because the ship had already I landed? I you can sell it. It's already there. Yeah, you kind of have to just, you know, lick your wounds, I guess. But the toll side of it makes 100 you know, that makes a lot of sense. A if lot of sense. You're taking the... 
you're taking the ingots back, the sows back out. You've got a home for those, um, and you've got somebody well, else committed. Yeah. yeah, you've got somebody else committed on the back end of that contract. So I could definitely see the the value, the value behind that. Yeah, I mean it's they serve brokers. The first. Brokers are, in my opinion, if they're good. They're very, you know, relationship driven. They understand like what your needs are as a customer. And this isn't just like brokers and scrap. Like this is brokers and any truck or Anything. freight, whatever it is. They they're they're there to service something that you decided it's better to deal with them than deal with the yeah. other party. I when I was at I'll use the example, when I was at down at Sturgis, I just didn't have a real logistics department and I was doing brokering and even getting stuff moved out of the, our own yards, I used a broker. And I really used the broker. And I'll give a shout-out to Rob Winnick. <laughs> but uh, basically, I said, here's my customers. Here's what I bought. Here's where it's delivered. Set it up. Yeah. That was the information I gave him. Yeah, he didn't like it. It's kind of a bit of a pain in the uh-huh. butt. And I know it cost me a little extra. But I didn't want to have to make that phone call to the dealer. Is the load ready? Is it not ready? Yeah, and then finding the truck, and then if it doesn't deliver on time, I have somebody else to blame. Well, it goes like it goes like this: it, your time, every minute of your time, every hour is worth X amount to you. So, if I can make more money calling on customers, securing more scrap, while you deal with the logistics, and it costs me an extra hundred dollars a load or whatever, you take care of the Calculate logistics it. side. You take it. I don't want to yeah. deal with it. You take care of it. I'm getting my materials getting delivered, picked up, whatever it is. And I'm able to focus my energy on my customer, my my relationships. There's there's just That's just one small example where a brokerage yeah. can provide a ton of value, oh, right? It, a heck of a lot of value. Yeah. I just And again, I wasn't always most detailed, so you may have have to call and double check with a few. Oh, just call them and get the PO number. Yeah. You were detailed <laughs> when it came to the percentages and, and what you were buying, buying and what you were selling, but maybe not the actual details of the the freight or hey, the wh- exactly or goes. maybe see that uh, you know sometimes i've had the air where you know you, you're brokering something and uh the address happens to be where the company is that i'm working for yeah and all of a sudden the logistics or the trucker picks it up and I'm, now i'm finding it delivered somewhere else yeah rather than where it had to be and then you have to deal with that issue you don't like a lot of headaches. <laughs> no, no. Well, because we're naturally, we're going to get headaches in our industry no matter what. So you're trying to eliminate as many as possible because they're going to come in all forms. And you do know? you miss something? Like I said, I was uh, traveling with a guy visiting a few of his different yards. Somebody asked me to do an appraisal type thing. And he's watching me with the two phones, buying this or selling that. And he yeah. just asked me the questions. How do you keep track of that? Because he knew I wasn't writing this down, stuff uh-huh. down. I said, well, if I forget, somebody's going to remind me I bought a load of copper from them. <laughs> and I'll just say, okay. I, and I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, where's my order? Oh, okay. I'll send you the order. Well, when you were telling me, you know, last night, some of the volumes and some of the, you know, what, you know, as far as what some big outfits back in the day were moving. I mean, you you just telling that story here a little bit ago. There's a guy in the 80s that's sitting on a million and a half pounds of copper. You just. Oh, yeah. But he, the funny thing with Phyllis, when yeah. I did that. He'd always sell out his inventory in December, almost all his inventory, and he'd go to Florida for three months. Oh. And so I'd have to ask him because the... with aluminum, I don't know if you've kind of followed over the year, you know, at the end of the year in December, nobody really wants inventory, and the pricing isn't actually the, the best. And I've generally followed that over the years. The aluminum price generally is 2 to $0.04 cents better come January or February. Yeah. But he just was under that thing, I'm going to go to Florida for the three months. And sell out his inventory just so he didn't have to worry about it and then rebuild the inventory. Which is similar to some of these publicly traded companies that they'll move inventory when they when their quarter before their quarter ends and, and they'll then, move yeah. it at the price that it is the time because they want to get that on the books Off for their, their books, quarter. Or, yeah, for the money. You know, they want to get the, the, the sale on their books and say, Okay, we have X sale and we put this towards the bottom line and this that to make our quarter or a year look good and the guys that are out there, they're with it. They they should be able to probably get a penny or two. The other thing that goes along <laughs> with that, I've never understand the scrap. I've made too much money this year, and it's October. I'm not going to sell any scrap because they don't want to pay more taxes. I never in- understood LIFO and FIFO. 
yeah. was always a, <laughs> was always last a in first bit. out. Yeah. I said, wait, if the market's so down, you don't want to do it. Uh, then I started with the other thing is, well, how about this? What if you ship me the scrap and I just show you it's in my inventory uh-huh. for your tax purposes? Yeah, and I've seen companies that have done that here. I got a, I, I need so much of this inventory for LIFO or FIFO, and I've been with a company where they actually sent me out to buy material and let them keep that material, but put it in our name and we buy and resell it to them. There you go. Because, well, I mean, think about it. Let's say if it's a, if an item's a dollar and you you sold it today and it's towards the end of the year, whatever it is, and then it, it moves a penny or two, but what are you paying on that from a tax standpoint? If you, you go know? back those years, you'd be having to pay 70, 80 percent exactly. taxes. I mean, I don't think it's that bad now. I yeah, it's not, but still, you're still anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, right? Depends on state and feds and all that. But if you can move it, and because and because you can't, you can predict maybe this month or at least have a rough feel for it on the Ferris or whatever side, but you can't predict 2021. So I think people are willing to take no. the gamble, push it into the 2021 and say, I'll take, if I make some money early 2021, then if the rest of the year is shit, then at least yeah. I'm not going to, you know, pay a bunch of tax. And I, again, I've never been one to have to worry about the tax yeah. or how those things go, but I'd be arguing with people. What do you mean? <laughs> you don't want to sell it. Yeah. Aren't you in this business of selling and buying and selling and buying? Yeah. And I, it's so great that, oh. Don't have, and it's funny. I got some dealers up in up in the Dakotas. I mean, hey, they haven't sold their copper since it was the four dollars a pound. Yeah, four and a half, right? Four, four and a half, whatever we reached, and they're still holding yeah. every pound. But I call them, and well, brasses haven't changed too much, or electric <laughs> motors. You know, even though the market's gone up twenty cents, the motor price is still about the same. So at least move the stuff. Yeah, that doesn't have the upside potential for you. Then it was so funny the last time we were getting up towards that three. Up, oh, I'm going to sell when it's three dollars. Well, well, we're three ten now. Even recently, yeah. Well, no, uh, three fifteen. Three. Now it got. Uh, now I had one guy call me back, and we're back down to three. Why didn't you sell it to me when it was, yeah, three ten? Uh huh. And I, I sometimes. I mean, there's a lot of old school in some, and there's still a lot of old school in our oh. industry. I mean, it's, it's still. I mean, there's. Handshake. It doesn't go to waste. In other words, it's still sitting there. And you know what? I think there's a lot of people that if they could put a million dollars in the bank, or they could put a million dollars of copper in the in their warehouse, and they don't say need the cash per se. They have the space, and they're just a more um, physical. Like they want to be able to see it, touch it, smell it when they walk in, and know that there's a million dollars worth of copper in that warehouse because. At today, if you put a million dollars of cash in the bank and you earn a 0.02% on your money, it's not even worth putting in there. And I think that a lot of people will just put that scrap in their warehouse and be like, that's good enough. I'd rather the other thing that it. kind of changed the industry besides peanuts is the fact uh, when a lot of scrap companies, old scrap companies, their children, didn't, they didn't want their children in the business. Become yeah. a doctor, an accountant, a lawyer, or whatever. And then they had to start hiring professional people who actually took a look at costs. Uh And that's trained tremendously because of these bigger companies. They have to turn their inventory. Yes. It's not like they, you know, you can talk to them and say, no, no, no. Copper's going up another 50. Hey, we were down to $2. Hey. Yeah. I said, hey, we're going to, you know, we went from $3.28 back down to $2 and struggled our way back up. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, they keep turning no matter what, and they don't want to hear putting to the side. And how much of that has changed be, what, where people are starting to hedge more, right? I mean, oh. when did the hedging really get to become a big part of the scrap business from your perspective? Well, it's from the copper side, it was pretty much almost always there. The major merchants and brokers had to do that. One of the things I always did is I liked to, I liked to buy high and sell low. Didn't make any sense, but obviously when the markets go down, the differentials or the spreads get tighter. Tighten up, yeah. Or go, you know, wider. Uh, so hedging's uh, been a part of me, you know, you know, full time since about nineteen. I can't. How can you take an order and sell if you don't own the stuff, but you, at least you got a spread? Yeah. You may be at risk for the spread differential, 
but at least you've protected yourself. And the idea is to be a, almost a net zero. Yeah. And they've done this with aluminum. And, you know, more and more the mills did that. And they started in the late, oh, in the late 80s doing that. Mm -hmm. And pretty much I would say 100, no, I can't, never, it's never 100%, but 100, a good portion of the mills now all go up and down. Yeah. And those brokers that took positions last year at such, at what was really, personal opinion, was the widest differential between prime and scrap grades yeah. ever had been. It's kind of like locking in business for the year of number two copper at 45 under. Yeah, which <laughs> which you wouldn't do. Yeah, now they're out chasing to fill these orders, and they're trying to buy it as cheap as they can, but just to fill it and get it off the books. Off the books. Yeah, I mean it's great, and you know, do it. You know, quarterly. Uh, one of the things I I tried to do with, and again, being fairness with uh, with industrial accounts, and they were always off of the American metal market or the Iron Age, and sometimes the American metal market wouldn't change their prices at all. Yeah. So when I was with Sturgis, where we handled a lot of aluminum, I got friendly with the guy on the desk at AM. Hey, you haven't lowered the price yet. This spread isn't this big, but if but it was in my favor, yeah, I wouldn't make the phone call. Yeah. So you're ma so those guys, unless they're really truly so, so in the I, business. Yeah. So with yeah. some large companies, I I convinced them that hey, let's do it quarterly, and when the spread gets too out of whack, one way or the other, we're going to negotiate. Say here, this is. The differential, I want my five percent profit. I want this, and it, and it worked nice. Then you readjust the price because pretty much a lot of times on that formula, it's kind of a a, a win lose situation for one side or the other. Yeah, and but the, the big corporations they don't care even if they're selling it at the lower price because they're buying against a certain formula. Exactly, the they got the the volume to support it. But I just did not like being upside down. No, I just. I well, when you're talking about you, you know, you're buying five, ten, fifteen containers of copper and brass, and you know you start or more, and then you start you start doing the math on that, and then especially the swings we've been having lately, where you get you know big swings. I mean, that's you know that's the difference of making money and losing a lot of money. You know, in a day. One or two. of my first copper deals uh, was with Halstead Metals, which was in Wynn, Arkansas. I just started, it was maybe 78, 79, and I was dealing with a company called Diversified, which basically spread out to be other people out of St. Louis that was there. And I have three loads of Green Line Copper. Okay. They're going down. The, the first load gets rejected. Okay. And I'm saying, what am I going to do? Well, you know, I'm going to fly down to Wynn and just see what the problem is. Instead of saying it's rejected and the broker says, here, we'll take it to this scrap dealer. He'll charge you five cents a pound and rework it. I wanted, as a first beginning, I just wanted to know what the uh, situation was. So I go yeah. down there and uh, I find a scrap dealer about 10 miles from the plant. Have a conversation with him, uh, Martin Snyder. Uh, and he says, you know, you're the first person that's ever stopped in here to ask if I would do that because they were taking them to major processors, either in Little Rock or Memphis. Yeah. So he takes in my load. Uh, I, of course, it was hedged, or I sold it at a, a fixed price or whatever. First load gets, re all three, basically to make a point, all three loads got rejected. I'm, I'm learning. Well, we tied the green line coils with aluminum Oh. Or the way it came right out of the utility, mm -hmm. or copper coated steel was used yep. to wrap the coil. And then sometimes they'll they'll mix it, like they'll run off, off a spool. They'll run copper, copper, copper. copper and then all of a sudden they're running yeah. copper clad, and, you're, and it's, the spool is mixed. It cost me twelve hundred and fifty dollars for all three loads. And this is when I also learned, different than the iron business, that uh, they don't mills, at least the non -inverse, don't really reject for market going up or down. You know, yeah. like, oh, no, no, the market went down and you're just yeah. hitting me like that. Uh -huh. So uh, actually my rejects, I turned around and sold for more money because the copper market came up, yeah. the ones that he did. So they didn't they, they didn't actually fix the price until you actually delivered well, see, That's what material. I started doing later. A lot of times is why do I want to have to ship into a place with a fixed price and be worried about the market? 
Because if mm-hmm. you're hedging, I can ship it. If it gets rejected, I don't have the, the market loss per se yeah. because it hasn't been priced. So, so if the spread's up or down, you could even cancel an order and they could buy back the market. Would you recommend like smaller recycling companies hedging or are you just recommending hedging for, you know, your medium to larger size? Probably your medium to larger. Yeah. I mean, the small one, like I say, those guys, well, here, the guy in the Dakotas, I was talking to him uh, last week or the week before. He says, oh, yeah, I'm finally, you know, had some time to clean up stuff. Yeah, I just found underneath my aluminum pile 70,000 pounds of green line wire on spools. My dad wouldn't even know that because it was yeah. from his father, oh. who had passed away. It was sitting; they buried it under some other material. Which means, and, how he, long and is I that came back there? and I talked to him. He said, "Oh, there was more than seventy thousand pounds, yeah. but they That's hid a good it under find. pile." Uh, can I find seventy thousand pounds of green line wire in my, in yard, my somewhere yard somewhere? somewhere <laughs> that they hid it. Okay, go on. And again, I don't know if that was in his aluminum inventory <laughs> for his tax purposes <laughs> or not. Back to taxes. Back to taxes. <laughs> So you wouldn't recommend like, I mean, we're not a huge, um, you know, scrap s- s- processor in the whole. Yeah, you are. Scheme with, of you, yes, you are. When you're talking your chops and all these yeah. other things, and you are. Would you recommend a company our size to hedge? I would probably say yes. You yeah. have to take a look at your own positions, and then you got to take a look what do you consider in your position. I even considered the insulated copper as part of my hedging position. Because okay. if you got insulated copper, you know what the recovery is. Yeah. You know you're not going to have it for three months. And all of a sudden you take a look and copper's, you know, 320 out there. Hey, that's a pretty good price. I wouldn't mind locking that in so you could actually take X amount of contracts yeah. and take your time to do it. And you went three months out or four months out. And you can do it on stainless steel. Hmm. Uh, about one nickel contract is good for about three truckloads of 304. Okay. Stainless. I convinced somebody to do that one year, and instead of doing it with me, he just did it with another yeah, <laughs> stainless yeah. company. Uh, but still, like, yeah. but it's it's a, it was just, it protecting was a, yourself. I think is four months. You got the investment, but is and it, it, isn't that expensive? No, it's not. But does it take away part of the part of the scrap business? And and I I guarantee you can attest to it. You know whether it's true or false, but. There's a, there's a, it's a form of gambling in, in our oh, industry absolutely. on the commodities. Like there's a, there's a gambling aspect to what we do. Oh, they love, it is gambling. I mean, it's, I don't, I used Excuse to. Excuse me, not with the, no, but the it, risk factor. It is to a certain extent, right? Like you're, you're small operators like us, like it, there is a, a portion of it that, you know, I, I don't have to go to Vegas and pull slots, right? Like I don't, I, I enjoy go play 21. I enjoy playing pie gal poker. I enjoy sitting around the craps table. Like I do it recreationally because I enjoy the gambling, you know, the aspect. I like to go to Vegas and bet on sports. But generally speaking, like we gamble so hard every day doing what we do that there, it, there is a component of that that, that the hedging kind of takes out of the business, right? It, it, it basically does take some of your risk off. Yeah. So, it, it, and, but again, a lot of people like that risk. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is sometimes you sit there and say, well, you know, geez, they're not paying enough for this product. You know, you're just down on the bottom of something and you know where the spreads have been historically and yeah. everything else. And you say, hey, you know, I'm just going to put that stuff down. I mean, when they're paying 20 cents a pound or 23 cents a pound for stainless steel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You might hey, as well. Hey, I'm going to just lay it down. Yeah. Make a pile. Yeah. It's it isn't a huge investment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, from the cost, but you know, I'll keep moving the other material. Yeah, you, you pick an item or two that you want to just keep making have it go some away. fun with. Yep, for sure. You can't gamble on every single item. And no. our business, I mean, you we need cash flow. It depends. Yeah, we pretty much uh, we we try and move our inventory as quickly as possible. That's just the nature of how we do it. Now we don't hedge, so we try and move it in. But you can time. Hedge. I mean, wh- whoever you're selling to, you can basically lock in. When you can you lock want. in the price. Twi- half a load. For that sure. was one of the good things I was able to do with some people is here, you want to sell me 10,000 or 15,000. Hey, you go hedge it. You go, I go them, hedge it for them. Via the market, how you, via on the your market, end, however they want. You and know, I give them open pricing. Yes. And uh, was, you know, running out with, you know, 75% advance, 
which I had to do because if the market goes too far the wrong direction. Yeah, your margin call. I'm the one. Yeah, you, you got a margin, margin call and keep it, keep it going, keep it. right? But, uh, you know, it's an option that people can use. I mean, here, if copper is sitting down here where it was two bucks, and you guys say, here, you know something? We'll head you off at next March, six months yeah. down the road, and it's more higher in the future. That's what we do. And it, the biggest thing that comes into some yards to have that option is if they know whatever happens to the copper market, whether it's three months out or five months out, uh -huh. they'd have to sell that stuff anyway. Yeah. So the biggest convention, free up warehouse space, yeah. convert to cash, and you still own your material. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. But you cannot, the one thing I have, it's very difficult impossible to hedge any particular brasses for the ingot makers because it's strictly a supply and demand. So you're just hedging the copper units? The copper units. Is all you can really Like Foss do. bronze or something, anything that has high yeah. mill value. That hmm. the, the basically, it's the way the mills buy, they're buying on the intrinsic values and a percentage of the intrinsic value. So much a discount for copper, so much a discount for zinc. And I can't worry about the copper more than everything else. Yeah, you know, it, it's a protection plan. So I'll switch gears a little yeah. bit on you. So how many? How many? Son, you said you have three sons. You showed me a picture three of them sons. yesterday, right? Any daughters? No daughters. daughters. So three sons. Are they all three in the scrap? No, no. Is one's uh, just <laughs> one is a lawyer, and the other one's an an artist, and he's uh, basically a manager of graphics for Wendy's corporate. Okay. And, and that's the why they're both in Columbus. They just the two kids just found out in uh, in the market there. Yeah, and then you have the other son that's in uh, Texas. Texas. Who's got? And a, here, this is this is a peony story. Okay. Go ahead. I was working with uh, Shine Brothers, and uh, I'll shout out some names. Mark Chaz now is basically with Venture Metal. Okay. They picked up Versatile. Yeah. Uh, Which I I've done some business with Venture. Okay. Good, but but Mark and yeah. those guys. Uh, I get a phone call out of the blue. Oh, is it Shine? From Peony. Not from Peony, but Mark had gotten my name off of Peony. Yeah. So I was running them into a mill, you know, chop load after chop load after chop load. And uh, when my son had left uh, American Iron, he basically wound up with those guys, moves to Dallas, and eventually gets married. I mean, if it wasn't for Peony, my son would have never managed to, to get down in Dallas yeah. and get married. It was just kind it's of like small, one of those, those sm small things. Yeah, small world. That's kind of how that deal goes. So your prediction, you're, you're super well-versed I mean, I, in this industry, and I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire too hard or anything. I'm mean, just, just make a guess. Where do you see... Because, I mean, as much as you've bought non-Ferris and everything else, I mean, the reason you came... To visit us is to to give us some knowledge on the on the brass end of our. Of yeah, our you stuff. reached out and to just, me, and I thought it was hey, kind of neat, and I'll. And you know what? It. And that's why I said for me, like I, I'm beyond appreciative. So, that being said, what's your your take? What's your 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 outlook where the copper market is going? Well, you, uh, basically, I was looking for three twenty five before the end of the year, and probably see three fifty or better next year. Uh, China was kind of stagnant there, and now they're stepping up, and there was definitely an oversupply of material. And uh, even in the chopping business, with everybody having yeah. choppers now, there's an abundance of chops that didn't exist before. Yeah. Uh, and again, due to the elections or the stimulus or whatever's happening, that puts a question into it. As far as I see the market, there's news every day. The question whether the news is positive or negative whether there's a strike at Codelco or yeah. there isn't. The, mar the bulls, or the, they pick up some news to run one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So I kind of consider the market kind of like a river flow with its ebbs and ties, yeah. that it's nothing totally Pacific. It's just, you know, sell on the rumor or how they used to say yeah, it. Yeah, buy the rumor, sell buy the, the news. Buy the rumor, sell or, the news. Yeah, type of deal. Type of deal, but it does seem or appears we were headed that direction. And I find the market's periodically, whether it's on the downside mm. or the upside, it tries to take out its last low or take out its last high. 
and the the last real high was really pretty much around 325. They got up to 321 and change. Yeah. I mean, it did pop up. That's one thing with hedging. You always put orders in above because some people did get that stuff off at 328 or when you mentioned 450, it was like a one-day deal. Yeah. You know, through four and just shot up the other way. But what I tell people is, like, so 450 sounds great, but the spreads at that time, you know, on the chops was like, I think it was on number one, it feels like it was like 30 cents. Yeah. Uh, historically, yeah. I've, you know, the number two spread when we were up and around that thing uh, was somewhere up around 60 cents under. Yeah, 60 uh, under. Bright was around 30, and uh, number one was 45 or something. Uh-huh. And I was telling somebody, they're, they're like, 60 cents? I go, yeah, but at 450, you're still like almost $4. But if you're you had, you got an issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or if you locked in spreads, just like whether you did with the aluminum and you got yourself in a bad deal. Yeah. Uh, one time, I, hey, I know from the high of the market, you know, Bear Bright was running three to five over. Number one was running two to three under. And number two was running uh, 10 to 12 under. Uh, so a and in particular, at a time like that, I say, hey, I might just want to sell for the next six months. I yeah. mean, when you're at a historic kind of spreads, you'd like to find somebody to lock you in for a number of months, yeah. which, which was able to be done. But you look back at the market, only in 2001, we were down to 63 cents on COMEX yeah. to realize that it was like that. So I had a situation with a guy, oh, I'm not going to sell my copper. Why would I sell my copper at these prices? Uh-huh. Well... I, I said, here, here's the deal. You got 3 million pounds of copper in your warehouse. It's 63 cents a pound. These are historic spreads. And I said, here, when you want, either I will replace the copper into your warehouse or you can have the option to price it. Yeah. Because it's such spreads. And you can imagine what you, if, you, if you locked in for a year at 15 or 18 cent better spread than anybody. Yeah. It's it's kind of nice. but you got to realize where what you're getting paid the spread just hey it's just too wide things might get better. Yeah, it makes sense. It may not, but I, when you're looking at historic lows. I do believe that once the ele- this is just my two cents on it is I I feel that once the election has run its course, make next week we'll know. Well, I, I think maybe maybe not. We'll know the direction, but I think that it'll take some of the guesswork out of it. And then the Chinese are going to be huge consumers of copper. And I think that India is is going to be a huge consumer of copper. And still, they are today, and they'll be even more. And you still have Japan and Korea. Japan, Korea, plus us as a country. And as, as people even transition, even if it's a slow transition into alternative power, right? Um, which is whether it's solar or electric, you, you name it. I guess that is, those are big copper drivers. Yeah. And at some point by being able to produce um, chops, I think that now that gives you the, the Chinese option where if you were just an insulated seller, maybe you did, you did that option kind of went away for a while or the spreads got too wide for you, which is what, which is what made me make the switch. But um, I didn't like the spreads, but I think that there's going to be a pretty good demand for copper, which should push the price if we get a yeah, beat correct. down dollar. And it switches around because mm-hmm. six months or seven months ago when the China was out and the U.S. wasn't so bad, the prices in Europe shot up. And a lot of people didn't realize that the mark was seven or eight cents moving into Europe than moving into China or moving into the United States. Yeah. It's a little more difficult to grasp when they're talking. Again, when you ship stuff over there, sometimes you got to wait the 120 days till it gets delivered and different things. Yeah. And understand, I mean, even some of the red brasses, and again, they look at the uh, percentage of what they have to pay for copper, and they will pay more for red brass with the copper in 10 units than the Chinese were or the U.S. people. And it kind of like can rotate between North America to Europe to the Far East hmm. when it, something gets out of whack. Well, and there's no refineries in the United States anymore. To, yeah, it was kind of... They do refinery yeah. type stuff. But you're seeing, I mean, and you're seeing they're starting to, people are starting to come back around and it's kind of like everything out yeah. of style, in style. Like There's a couple refineries, copper refineries being built right now, 
right? There was I just There's read been news is something. the news. They're 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 in the process of 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 dialing it all in, right? One over there in the Midwest, if I recall. Um, I believe there was. Yeah. So I don't I, know how far it's developed along the way. But they've been talking about it. So but I think other, that going back to you when you're talking about the electric vehicles, uh, uh, this last February I was in over in Europe for a meeting, and uh, basically they said by 2025 all Europe's going to be electrical vehicles, uh, no more basically getting rid of the dust, the combustible engine situation, and that was going to basically obviously cause an increase for the use of copper and nickel for the electric vehicles, like an yeah. additional 14% yeah. for copper usage. So that's that's going, and then if you look at some of the ways some of the U.S. is speaking, they're gonna be going to the electric vehicles, and and that's just one they gotta expand thing. the mileage. I mean, if you're yeah. a salesman on the road, I don't know exactly how you yeah. run an electric car. But I mean, everything is becoming or battery, electric trucks, electric, yeah. even semis. Yeah. I think hydrogen is probably the, the way that that deal is going to go, just from a horsepower standpoint. But who knows? I mean, things happen every day on the back, and people are working on new stuff and all the time. And what's nice, well, or for me is just it's there's always something different. Yes. And, That's and our beautiful business. thing it's about It does our not get boring. Yep. And when you think you knew it, oh, crap. I guess I was wrong about that one. Yep. Well, I will say this. I've learned a lot in the last 24 hours, and I appreciate you coming in and sitting down. I appreciate down. it inviting me. And you know what? I know you were telling me last night that you were writing a book. When you write the book, book. and I, this is like my way of holding your feet to the fire, nah, gonna, write gonna the fucking right. book. Yeah. When you write the book, we're going to bring you back, Okay. and we're going to fucking talk about the book, and because okay. you are a book of knowledge in our industry, and... You're the, you know, it's guys like you that, man, that make me love what I do. Thank you. So thank you for I coming. I just love the scrap life. I appreciate it, man. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>